Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by Janine Turner and me, Kathy Gillespie, along with Constituting America's student ambassadors, Tova Kaplan and Dakari Chapman, where we talk about hot topic issues with constitutional experts. We want to start tonight by thanking our sponsor, who has asked to remain anonymous, but he wants us to be sure and let everybody know that he loves Constituting America's 90-day studies, and he encourages everyone to go on and check out our, our current 90-day study on important dates in American history. And if you'd like to sponsor a constitutional chat, just email me at Kathy, C-A-T-H-Y, at constitutingamerica.org. Now, we are very excited for tonight's topic of education and COVID-19. Our special guest is Elizabeth Schultz, who is the Fairfax County, Virginia School Board member emeritus. Now, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth in a few minutes, but first I'm going to talk about the rest of the people on our panel. Janine Turner cannot be with us tonight, but we want to say a few words about Janine because she's our founder and co-president. Janine is famous for her role as Maggie O'Connell in television's Northern Exposure. She, as I said, is the founder and co-president of Constituting America, which launched in 2010. She's still acting, but she's also actively teaching kids about the United States Constitution, having given over 540 speeches to classrooms across the country. Now, we are very excited to have with us tonight, Jay McConville on our board. Jay is a management professional and active civic volunteer. He was recently accepted into the doctoral program at the Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs, where he's pursuing a PhD in public policy and administration. And prior to beginning his doctoral studies, he was the founder and owner of Emerald Collaborative Partners, LLC, a management consultancy focused on aerospace and the defense industry. And over his 26 year business career, Jay has held multiple key positions including director, vice president, and CEO with several leading aerospace firms. Now, Jay is also a veteran, and Jay, we thank you for your service to our country. Jay served as a U.S. Army intelligence officer in multiple positions around the world, including the 1st Cavalry Division during Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and Desert Storm. Throughout his career, Jay's been very active in many civic and industry volunteer associations, as I mentioned earlier, we are very blessed to have Jay as a member of our Constituting America Board of Directors. He has a Bachelor of Arts from George Mason University and a Master of Science in Strategic Intelligence from the Defense Intelligence College. He lives in Richmond, Virginia with his wife of 35 years, my good friend, Sue McConville. They have three wonderful children and one granddaughter. So Jay, we are so excited to have you with us tonight. Now also, on our panel, we have two wonderful students. Tova Love Kaplan is 16 years old and lives in Chicago, Illinois. Tova currently serves as our National Youth Director for Constituting America and runs the National Youth Advisory Council. She's a three-time winner of the We the Future contest and the entrepreneurial where she created a marketing plan, PSA, entitled Know Your Rights, Read the Constitution, and STEM, where she created an app and is currently getting that app ready to launch on major app platforms for Constituting America. Tova is passionate about educating and empowering young people to use their constitutional rights. And we are blessed to have Tova's leadership as National Youth Director. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you all so much for joining us and I hope you all enjoy the show. We also have with us tonight, Dakari Chapman who's our Constituting America student ambassador. Dakari is 17 years old, is currently a junior full-time college student in South Carolina. 
He's won Constituting America's We the Future contest twice, once for his best PSA, where he reminded viewers the Constitution is an American thing, so know it, and twice for his short film, Man on the Street. He is actively involved in our National Youth Advisory Board. Now, Dakari is also a working actor, seen most recently in HBO's The Righteous Gemstones and Netflix Outer Banks just out three months ago. Dakari wishes to be an actor, but also a politician, but he says you must be an actor to be a politician. Hello, everyone. So glad that you guys have joined us. Uh, thank you, Mr. J, for filling in for Janine on her night off, and we sure do miss her, but we're glad you're here, and thank you for your service, sir, and thank you, Kathy and Jeanette. Jeanette is a retired teacher from former uh, and former PTA president. She's our director of operations. Jeanette organizes all of our school presentations and many other aspects of Constituting America, and she does a fabulous job. Jeanette, you want to say hello real quick? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on this extremely important topic of education and what's happening in the world in COVID-19. Teachers, parents, students, we're here to help you at Constituting America. We would love to bring our message to your students at this time. It is so necessary for the students to be aware of the Constitution and what their rights are. And we can help you with that. Teachers, just reach out to us. Parents, let reach out to us and connect us with your teachers and your school administrators, geneticconstitutingamerica.org, or just go to select a speech on our website. And thank you so much again for joining us. Our very special guest tonight is Elizabeth Schultz who's a former Fairfax County School Board member. Mrs. Schultz is an education and public policy expert and former professional senior contracts and negotiation manager with 25 years of experience in organizations specializing in the areas of asset management, information technology, global and K-12 education. Mrs. Schultz was twice elected to the Fairfax County School Board, the nation's 10th largest school system. While serving a decade in combined elected service plus public advocacy, Elizabeth has strived to act as a voice of reason and common sense decision making. Elizabeth holds a BS in political science and history from James Madison University and is married and has three children. Elizabeth, welcome and thank you so much for being with us tonight. We are so excited to have you. And we wanted to start with just asking you to make a few opening comments. Well, I don't know which of my children I left off the bio, but I do have four boys. <laughs> Uh, on any given day, I'm sure that any mother would like to give maybe one of them back, but I have them all four for, for life. So I am just thrilled to be here. Um, I, I, I will tell you that um, having just recently departed the Fairfax County School Board, um, I still almost daily get comments from people um, by social media, by text, um, even walking through a grocery store or going to a medical office. Um, asking my opinion about how I would be advocating um, that the 10th largest school system go in terms of preparedness for this fall. Um, I am constantly keeping up on um, education matters, not only in the Washington metropolitan uh, region, and there's plenty to keep up on here, but um, from our largest uh, school system in, in New York City to other large systems like Los Angeles and Clark County, Nevada, Miami-Dade. So I'm very much um, keeping my fingers on the pulse of what's happening in, in education in America. And I very much look forward to this important topic that seems to actually be gripping um, everyone in the country, whether you're um, a student, a parent, a, a teacher or a PTA board member, um, an administrator or, um, or a policymaker who's in charge of making these decisions. Well, thank you. And our board member, Jay McConville, is going to act as moderator tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to Jay. And Jay, let you say hello and, and get us started. Well, thank you, Kathy. And thank you, everyone, for being on tonight. It's really great to be here with you. I enjoy these chats from afar and uh, get a question in every now and then. So it's great to be able to be on 
with you all and, and participate in the main discussion. And Elizabeth, it's great to see you again. Uh, for those who don't know, Elizabeth and I know each other from Fairfax County, Virginia, where we, we work together. And uh, when I remember when she was elected the first time to the school board, and it, it was really great to watch all the great service that you gave and the selfish way, selfless way that you gave yourself to the children of, uh, of that district, and, and which included my kids, by the way. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to start off with the, with the top level question. And when it comes down to education, basically it's about the children. So, uh, you know, there's many different options that have been put on the table about how children uh, can return to school or not. And so I would like maybe if you could start off just by talking about some of the factors that are most interesting to you. And I, as you said, you talk to other parents on the impact on the children of either going back to school or not going back to school or different combinations between. What do we need to be aware of that uh, they, and watch as these kids go through this unprecedented situation? Certainly, I, and I will tell you that um, in the last probably two to three weeks as some of the decision makers in different school boards across the country um, grapple with you know, what, what comes next. Um, you see really some of the largest school districts in the nation sort of leading the way. There are um, thir over 13 and a half thousand school districts in the nation. There are not a about 90,000 school board members. And there's a lot of state and federal policy makers, but what everybody doesn't understand is that at the end of the day, you know, all politics is local. Everything is made um, with the exception of possibly California. <laughs> we'll have to see how their governor is gonna weigh in. Um, it sounds like he may have, you know, um, he may be wrangling with a statewide decision, but that you see that local decision happening at the local level. In fact, a, a neighboring jurisdiction to ours just on, I believe, Thursday night had a school board meeting that went until, be still my beating heart, two o'clock in the morning, um, and had to have multiple votes in order to get through a deadlock about how to start the year. And so what's interesting is, is that it's really the same issue um, for the 51 million children in K through 12 public education in the country. You know, we really are, I'm concentrating my talk around K through 12, you know, higher ed is a whole different um, animal. But um, the, the discussion really centers around the same thing. And yet everybody is winding up with different variations of, of a selection. And if the problem is the same and everybody is coming up with different solutions to the problem, that therein lies, I think, some of the most interesting discussion. What is it that's driving different solutions to effectively the same problem? Other than, you know, and you have to allow for, there are hot spots um, in this country where, you know, there may be a, a slightly different solution, but um, I don't hear at the core of many of these discussions, be it New York, be it Chicago, um, Miami-Dade, LA, um, and then even into some of the smallest jurisdictions, which don't bubble up as much in the national discussion, what is best for children? What is best for their, not just their academic well-being, but their emotional well-being? their um, psychological, physical health, mental health, um, things that go around, you know, food insecurities for some of the most vulnerable students. And the notion that, you know, and many parents are operating and teachers are operating from a position of fear. And, and certainly, you know, um, I understand that any, any former or current official has to understand the operating, you know, of, putting policy into action but the first thing it's almost like physician do no harm the first thing has to be for a school board to consider what is best for children and how to maximize their decision making around what ends up being the best for children and creating a choice or a pathway for students who either they themselves are medically fragile or have a comorbid condition that does not lend itself to being 
um, exposed, or maybe they live in a multi-generational family. But a lot of the discussion that I have watched, that I have read, that I have seen um, in, the, in the national news, both in print and, um, and over, uh, over the television, the, the core of the discussion has not centered around what's best for the children. It's what all the adults are feeling. And that's, that's the frustrating part because then we're getting back to emotional decision making and we're not really necessarily drawing from some of uh, the peer nations that have returned to school and where there's data from which to draw. And that's very interesting, Elizabeth. I, and you know, we are uh, here at Constituting America, we talk about federalism sometimes and, the, and there's the laboratory of democracy that's out there. What are some of the good ideas you think that are coming out that do address the needs of the children? You sent something to us about LA. I know Fairfax is a huge district and maybe some smaller ones too. What, what are the good things you think that are being done to, to help I, us? I, I, I haven't seen a lot, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, there is, you know, I've seen everything from including, um, you know, because education doesn't just include public education. So there are, you know, um, private school jurisdictions, individual private schools, and, um, you know, there are, are certainly opportunities to draw from looking at those as well. And what I find interesting is, is that a lot of the private um, school systems or individual um, standalone schools are actually electing to go back full time. And when we juxtapose that against what's happening in the public school system, I've seen choices that vary from um, there's not going to be any school until at least January. You know, some of those decisions have been made. There's not going to be any school, you know, you know, no in-person school. There's only going to be digital school available until the end of the first quarter. The, um, they're still deciding. There are some school districts that still have not decided that are seem to be watching some of the larger school districts, you know, and drawing from them some sense of, okay, well, if they can do it, then we can do it. Then there are these hybrid models that seem to be ga gaining some ground in some jurisdictions, including Fairfax, where some children based on your last name are gonna to go to school two days a week, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, A through K and L through Z go, you know, Wednesdays and Fridays and nobody goes to school on Mondays. And what I don't hear, in, again, in any of those plans are particularly addressing some of, you know, the vulnerable populations. Um, and that includes uh, populations that are vulnerable from, you know, a food perspective that are vulnerable, certainly from special education. That's one of my, you know, I was a great champion and still am of, uh, of parents and students in the special education um, arena. And, you know, for example, in Fairfax County, there's about 14 and a half to 15,000 students who are special education. That's larger than many school districts in the entire country. And so what happens to those students who normally were receiving in-classroom supports um, daily or pull-out supports and, and reinforcement? And we're already, so many of these children are so far behind academically from losses that occurred this spring. You know, many schools closed in March. You know, we're, you know, halfway through, you know, turning the corner of July into August and no meaningful learning has happened for you know millions of children in in the united states of america so when does that ever get made up and if you already start behind the eight ball coming into the fall either delaying the opening of the school um, year and or combining that with reduced days um, in the classroom Many, many, many children cannot optimize learning through uh, through a computer screen. The ability to sit for hours a day, even an hour, and and meaningfully learn and have um, uh, simultaneous learning happening through a computer, um, we're we're really not addressing the academic impact. And then beyond that, you know, I had um, I've had medical professionals just in the last week tell me that um, either their patient load is tremendous in terms of the impacts that they're seeing on, on young patients, 
um, all kinds of, of medical and mental wellness issues um, cropping up. But then also what happens for parents who, who need to return to work and support their family, whether it's single parent household, a dual uh, working household, that there is a real struggle about the need to restore some normalcy and what that does for young minds and what this is going to do long-term, that there are gonna be long-term implications, um, medical professionals fear from this period where we're, we have, you know, a very traumatic thing happen in our country, but certainly in a young person's life that is so traumatic being ripped from their, their, their teachers, from their friends, from you know, social interactions, all the things that are lost that we're not gonna know for a long time. Thank you, you know, somebody, I was blessed to be able to work through the whole thing, and, but I've been on Zoom you know, all day long and I, I can attest that's not the optimal environment for interpersonal communication. I have a lot of more questions, but I'm not gonna hog it up. I'm gonna uh, turn over to uh, Toba, and uh, Toba, I'm sure you have some questions on your mind. Why don't you take it for a bit there? Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having this discussion. I'm actually a Chicago Public School student, um, which is obviously one of the biggest school districts in the country. So I've really been, uh, as all students have, been like listening and following the news very closely. Um, in Chicago, they actually just announced their plan, which is primarily online learning with uh, K through 10th grade coming in two days a week. I just graduated 10th grade and I'm in 11th grade, so I just missed the cutoff to be able to have in-person school. That's a whole nother discussion. But um, so it, it seems like at least in Chicago and most likely in other school districts, online learning is going to be most, if not a, a large portion of you know, learning for students in the upcoming year. Um, I experienced online learning in Chicago starting in March. So I had a large kind of experiment with it. And needless to say, it did not go well. Um, within Chicago, four out of 10 Chicago public school student, students were engaged less than two days a week. Um, and that was, you know, uh, you know, so many students were falling through the cracks. They say um, half of high school students weren't engaging um, every week. Uh, it was hard to contact students, as you mentioned, with inequities. In Chicago, there are a lot of homeless students, students without access to internet, without access to food. Um, so that is, those inequities are compounding. But my question is, since online learning is going to play such a big role in schools, um, how can we improve the system? Because at least in my experience, teaching skills did not transfer over well to online platforms. Students were not engaged. Um, they weren't learning a lot. Teachers seemed to be really struggling with the transition. Um, so how do you think that as, as a former teacher, how can teachers adapt more and really improve this platform to keep students engaged as we try to adapt to the situation? So um, I, you are exactly right. And I feel like what you have described is a microcosm of what a lot of students across the country, including my own, um, experienced both um, in uh, the K through 12 experience and actually in the higher ed experience was the ability. So now is learning dependent upon the technological savvy of the individual teacher and the technological access and savvy of the individual student and their family. So do you have access to broadband? Do you have the ability to navigate you know, different apps or different platforms across which learning is supposed to occur? Do you have a conducive environment um, in, at that particular time of day that the learning is supposed to occur? Um, you know, do you have uh, parents who are, you know, like Jay had described, who are there to be able to support um, a student who experiences technological dif difficulties um, or, or not. And you know, it, it really became a catch as catch can situation for millions of students, if not tens of millions of students across the country. And we don't have um, educational platforms in this country that are necessarily right now all conducive to online learning. 
Now, I think that some school districts are probably moving towards one-to-one -to -one technology, but the educational technology has not met the place of the need of the individual students. So certainly better policy, better policy at the federal level um, in terms of creating a roadmap for um, school districts in order to access and implement um, technology would be a tremendous assistance. In addition to that, you know, state governments have to fund it. Um, you know, whether the individual school districts get their funding from the state, which many do, a lot get it from federals, uh, very few like the one that um, I'm in and where I served, almost all of the money is local. But then it becomes how do we apply that money and support not just the acquisition of the technology to support the students, but the curriculum, the online curriculum that supports it, because I think that education is going to change going forward. I think you're going to see a lot more of student access um, if we can get this right. And then how do you train teachers? How is that sustainable? Um, we can't necessarily assume that teachers understand all of the technology, have access to the tools, have the professional learning opportunities so that they can effectively take the material and make it meaningful in a small group so that students can not only be exposed to the information, but acquire the knowledge. You know, knowledge acquisition is the goal at the end of this. And so it's very complex having 13 and a half thousand school districts in the country and all of those decisions largely being made local, but then the money coming from lots of different places and not a cohesive policy. So that's a great question. I'm going to go to Dakari in a second, but let me just follow briefly on that. Does it complicate the situation when you have school districts like I think has been announced in Fairfax where you're going to have this split situation where you have some kids are at home, I guess they're on Zoom or something equivalent, and then the other ones are in the classroom. How do, does that, seems to me that that would complicate the situation pretty, especially for the teacher. Well, I mean, certainly this is a novel idea that, you know, <laughs> nobody knows quite certain how it's going to work. There are certainly a lot of parents who are very upset. There are a lot of parents who, for whatever reason, you know, that this is what they're, they're supporting. But the practicality of um, students not going to school, you know, imagine you're a Tuesday, Thursday student. You're not in school Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You go to school one day, then you're home one day, you're back to school one day, and then you're out again for another cycle. Um, it, it doesn't facilitate learning. Um, block schedule is hard enough for high school students to adapt to once they, once they get there. And that's rolling you know, two days and three days a week and then switching the next week. But that's all classes and you're present. Never mind trying to concentrate, you know, seven classes into that time frame. And then what happens to physical education? You know, there's so many things that we have not seen um, a, a game plan for. And it's just under the auspices that there be, quote unquote, social distancing um, to have fewer children in the building. Well, uh, you know, if you have a school that normally has 4,000 students, and they go down to 2,000 students, and 2,000 are there on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and 2,000 are there on uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. I'm not entirely sure how that reduces that, you know, the science that's coming out of and the exposure of students and teachers um, and the lack of a, um, uh, of a transition of following, you know, that virus from even if students get it, that they're not passing it on to the adults in you know, the whole Finland, Sweden, uh, Norway, Germany, France, all of these uh, Western European countries have seen the opportunity of students getting back into the classroom and we're not seeing that exposure level. So um, I, I, I don't know functionally how it's going to work as a, as a current parent of a Fairfax County public school student. I, I personally don't know how it's going to work, and many, many parents, not just in Fairfax, but in other jurisdictions across the country, are struggling with how the practicality of this works. But that's, again, on the functional side, that doesn't even take into account the academic, uh, social, and emotional well-being of our, of our children. 
That's a great point. Uh, Dakari, uh, what's on your mind? You want to pick a question next? Yes, thank you so much for being here, Ms. Schultz. Um, you know, I'm in a program which is called like the Early College Program. I don't know if you've really heard of it, but it's kind of like where you're, you're, you're in high school for like two years and you end up graduating then by like your junior year, you're a full-time college student kind of thing. Um, and so my question is with, you know, you can't take the ACT and SAT from home. I mean, they're just not gonna let you do that. So my question is, are we gonna see a shift in standardized testing, even like students taking their exams? Cause I know even in North Carolina, they didn't do any exams this year. Um, so how is that gonna look? So what a great question. Um, and, and I will say that, uh, there is already a national trend away from these national exams for a lot of different reasons. And I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. We're at a point where we've already wiped out a half a semester of grades effectively for students. And we're sending a message that the meritocracy of grades do not matter. I'm familiar with the type of experience you had. My oldest son was dual enrolled in college, his senior year of high school and, and college. And to not have, be able to benchmark students on their, not, again, their knowledge acquisition that I was talking to Tova about earlier is, is a crucial factor in trying to understand what students have learned do we have national benchmarks anymore for um, measuring education in the country if we don't um, have ACTs, SATs, um, against which to measure how children have done? And for how long? You know, is this a temporary stoppage in, um, in normed, uh, nationally normed tests? Or are we going to see a new phase where you know, not needing an SAT to get into college is one thing, but not having an understanding of where we are as a nation in, in um, our young people's uh, ed education and how we're doing is a, is a huge consideration in this. And um, what do next year, I mean, you're already there, you, you have the luck that you, you have arrived. What happens to the juniors this year? Um, what, 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 how are they going to be applying to, to colleges? What are their grades going to look like? What classes are even going to be available to them? Because uh, I can't imagine on this slim down um, version of education that all the options will be available. So that's the other thing is we're, we're taking away from students their right to be able to access not only um, you know, some core classes, which I'm sure they'll find a way, but it'll be difficult to achieve in those core classes. But m most significantly, being able to expand their horizons with some of their electives. And so how, how is their performance going to be benchmarked for, for colleges? Or how are they going to be measured for the opportunity to do um, career readiness? Um, technical education is a huge issue in this country, and I think it's going to be a growing issue. Um, you cannot learn, you know, um, technological skills, you know, whether it's welding or car maintenance or, or uh, beauty or, you know, all of the, you know, uh, veterinary um, support, all of the opportunities that exist in career readiness you know, that's, those are hands-on opportunities. And so those also are, are missing when we are talking at, at maximum. The, the maximum I've heard is uh, kids going back two days a week, um, all the way to just complete distance learning. And, and it seems, Elizabeth, that that creates a, an, an equity issue too for different school districts. If you have one that's in a place like LA or Fairfax and they've limited where uh, versus a, a school district like where I am right now, which is in Southern Virginia, where we've had in the entire county seven COVID cases. I expect that they're probably gonna go back to school and just go back to regular school. Um, that's at least what they're talking about. And so those, uh, students are not handicapped in the same way uh, with all these difficulties about their grades and their tests and other things. So 
that brings that in too, right? So some, some people are just rolling on, others not. So I don't know how you deal with that. Uh, we, well, well, I just, just briefly, you know, what, what we're also modeling for, you know, everybody, you know, ages, you know, pre, pre-K on up to, to high school, um, uh, Tova and Dakari, you know, are inclusive of, uh, uh, representative of our student population. What we're showing is a lack of critical thinking skills. The very skills that we're hoping that students acquire um, are not taking place in the adults in their life and the decision factors going into how to return to school, how to return to school effectively, um, safely, how to provide options to parents, but that, you know, things like the flu, the regular flu is frankly far more dangerous at this point to children um, in, in terms of them being carriers and them acquiring flu than COVID is proving to be. And so what do we teach a, no, a whole successive generation about critical thinking skills um, as the adults in their lives and model the very behavior that we want them to acquire as a part of their education? Interesting, interesting. So let's hear from a teacher, a former teacher, Jeanette, you wanna uh, give us a little of that perspective, please. Sure, I do. Um, one of the things I, I want to say to all my fellow teachers is I totally understand the fear and anxiety, but you know, we have that every day when we walk into a classroom, whether it's going to be the latest outbreak of lice or God forbid a gun, you know, a school shooter. Um, but one of the things that I've been most proud of working with Constituting America is uh, I started in 2014, the growth of Constituting America, reaching out to Title I schools has been astronomical. And that was, that's was that been an important mission. Specifically, Kathy, Janine, and I have decide, decided years ago, we need to get into Title I schools, schools that don't have money for extra programs, schools that don't have the money to buy a constitution for each and every student and have a speaker come in. That's why with our program, we never charge. We never charge a school. People are always stunned. What do you mean that when, when I try to, you know how they say, um, there's nothing's for free? Trying to tell a school superintendent that we will come into your school and do this program for free. They're, they're waiting for the hook all the time. Um, there was a fascinating article today, and, and this, this ties all in with my concern for our Title I students and schools, is I don't know if you've heard about pandemic pods. We're seeing across the country clusters of parents that are able to afford to hire teachers, and they're creating virtual 2020, one, 20, 2020 school, uh, one, one room schoolhouses, where public schools is our great equalizer. And we're in a situation now, if we're not careful, we are going to have school districts and we're going to have parents and, and of course for, for wanting to make sure that their kids are continually educated, they're, going, they're able to hire teachers, they're able to hire grad students uh, to teach selectively small groups of kids in their neighborhood. And that really makes me nervous. It makes me nervous for all of the students that when we do go back, we're gonna, we've lost the balance that we've tried to achieve in our public schools. And so I think if perhaps we get this awareness out there that it's not about us, like you said, Elizabeth, in the beginning, it is about our students and bringing this to their students. So if all of you can go to your school board meetings and, and discuss this and, and bring this up and say, we need to get back in there and help the kids and teach the kids. And meanwhile, we know this great program that they'll come to your school for free, give all your kids a constitution and teach them about it. So that was my two cents. It's not necessarily a question, but it is a concern as, as an educator, as a parent and a taxpayer that our, our students, um, remain equal, equally educated, equal educational opportunities across the country. And if we're not careful, we're gonna create a great imbalance. And I think Jeanette, I think Tova wanted to jump in on that. Uh, yeah, before Elizabeth, you go ahead. Um, yeah, I just, uh, to your point about equity in Chicago, the private schools are planning on opening. Um, 
much, much more than the public schools. As of now, some private schools are planning to be fully open. Others are, you know, they're all planning on being more open than Chicago public schools. I know friends of mine who are upper socioeconomic levels are saying, okay, I'm going to go to private school now. Bye, guys. Like, they're just, they have those resources to be able to easily switch without even a second thought. Whereas I have other friends who are struggling to even afford food now that they can't get food at school. Friends who don't have reliable Wi-Fi and they're trying to figure out if they can even get any level of schooling at all in the upcoming year. Um, so I, I like that you brought that up because it is a really, really big problem that I'm worried that students are going to fall behind, not because they're less motivated, not because they don't have those same skills as their wealthier, more well-connected peers, but simply because they don't have those resources because of matters that are totally out of their control. So I think that's um, really interesting to note, um, especially as we see the differences in strategy between public and more expensive private schools. It'll just be a really interesting development to track. Yeah, Elizabeth, what do you think about that? Is there anything good, a good news on that, uh, trying to address, especially kids who don't have the resources? Um, I'm going to tell you that Jeanette hit it um, spot on. Um, that is an incredible concern um, in the decisions that are being made at this point. The students who have the most means or the most um, opportunity um, to their families, um, within their community, are going to find a way to get um, educated or at least better educated than the, their surrounding school district allows. I just heard a uh, extended conversation yesterday uh, um, from a woman in, um, in the surrounding area of LA, for example, and the parents are doing exactly what Jeanette um, said, but they, they themselves have uh, garnered amongst themselves who has what skills and former teachers and everybody is, is banding together and they are creating a school. And they have said, you know, we're giving up on our public school system. And so you are going to see people who abandon public school and go to private school. You are going to see people um, homeschool at increasing, increasing rates. You are going to see people create, you know, their own community school and they're going to educate who they want to educate. And the people who are going to be most affected are going to be, you know, special education students and their families are going to be Title I um, students and their families, and and really the ones who don't have a choice, the ones the in between, you know, the the regular kids, you know, the regular kids in between are going to get left behind, and you are going to create more chasms of opportunity and access in this country than, than already exist. So it's not just about technology, it's about all the other supporting resources that are available to, to a child um, and, and their family to either have an educational success or not. Excellent, so yes, Kathy, do we have some questions from the other folks joining us tonight? Well, I was going to say we've got some great people in our audience tonight. I can see that we've got uh, our Kim Rostick, who is one of our former best teacher lesson plan winners. And we've got Terry Cherry, who's our educational consultant and our former president of the National Council of the Social Studies. And we've got Heather Loudon, who's a teacher at Grapevine Faith. And Heather's been helping us on some projects uh, this summer. So I, wanna, I do want to invite all of our great audience members to, to throw some questions into the queue here. But I also, Elizabeth, just wanted to, to thank you for your service as a school board member, because I, of all the elected positions, I think that's probably one of the toughest. And I, I know that firsthand because I don't know if you know this, but my mother-in-law, Ed's mother, Connie Gillespie, was the first woman ever elected to school board and her uh, Pemberton Township School Board, I think, first elected in 1969. She served till 1982 and eventually became president of the school board and even got to hand uh, Tracy Gillespie, I know her diploma and maybe Ed as well. So we've, the Gillespies have school board in our blood <laughs> and we appreciate your service. But um, you know, I just, I wanted to, to ask, I, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but we do have one audience member who just asked, you know, the very basic question, is it safe for schools to open? And, you know, what, what is your opinion on that? 
So the thing I have to draw from is looking at uh, the reports that are coming out of uh, the Western European countries, um, the Finland, Sweden, Norway, France, Germany. There, there are real on the ground um, examples from which to draw and the science there is showing and we have everything from the American Pediatric Association and others from a medical standpoint, but the reality is, is that when you put the students in the classroom, they are showing that students are not, you know, they're not good ports for carrying this um, disease. Whether they get it is one thing, but if they get it, they're not passing it on. And so they're not getting sick. It doesn't mean no one's ever getting sick. Don't, don't, get, don't get me wrong. But that is not a factory for producing and spreading COVID. And so if that isn't the case, then, you know, Jeanette brought up a perfect example. You know, we've had schools where we've had Legionnaire's disease, where we've had severe, you know, stomach flu outbreaks, where you've had to close down half the school and clean it. We know, you know, educators and administrators know how to handle um, communicable diseases. It happens. And what, what isn't, I think, a good answer is a one-size-fits-all solution. Just because it happens, if there's an outbreak in one school, if one student gets it, to close down an entire jurisdiction, that's, that's the lack of critical thinking. You know, I think that there's been plenty of ramp up time for preparedness and schools can be prepared for an entry plan and also have backup plans that, you know, if somebody gets sick, what do you do? Is it, what if an adult gets sick? What if a child gets sick? You know, what, what is the approach? And this is the time that they need to be spending generating those plans and getting them into operational play for those students to come back in the fall. And Elizabeth, there's been some back and forth. It gets a little political about authorities, right? So who does, does, does the local school board have 100% of the authority to just make this decision? Yeah, the reality is, is that um, school boards are, are the convening authority for the jurisdiction of their local, local schools. So yes, they make the decisions unless you know, there is some kind of an executive order by a governor, and the only one that I've heard threatening it is Gavin Newsom in, in, in California. But the reality is, is that you, you, act, you really want that, that authority local because those are the people that are the most accountable. Um, you lose accountability the further up it goes. Uh, but we certainly are looking at and pleading with the local jurisdictions to look at what's best for the kids and get the kids back, but have the contingency plans in place should there need to be an alternate. And then you can always create choice. You can give parents the choice if they need to have a choice because of a child or a family member, or just because of you know, an increased level of concern, give them the choice. That's, that is the way that you best meet students where they are is creating the pathway to choice for the parents, but that you have the most liberal access in terms of opening schools for the greatest majority of the students possible. Kathy, are there others out there that we want to ask? I know, and I think Dakari, did you raise your hand? I you want to come to you too. You know, so Kathy, was there any on the online questions? If not, we'll go to Dakari. And you're muted. You're muted, Kathy. Let's make sure Dakari gets his question and then we'll go back to our queue in just a second. All right, Dakari. Uh, Mrs. Schultz, uh, thank you again. I, you know, heard what you said about schools reopening and, you know, about what you were saying about Norway and Sweden. And honestly, if I'm going to be honest, I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about, you know, my 70 and 80 year old professors that are walking in on canes, you know, trying to teach college kids. And even if they say wear a mask, I highly doubt half of them are gonna wear it, you know? So my thing is not, not me, because we've seen, but you know, we've seen the numbers, but 
you know, those professors or those even teachers, there's a lot of teachers that are in their 60s that are in that hot range um, for the virus. So my question is for them, you know, how does that look? Well, 60s all of a sudden became 80s. I don't know how that happens, but um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that this isn't just a question about the, uh, the children and their families, but it is for the educators as well, whether they're in a K through 12 environment or a uh, higher education. The reality is, is that the choice needs to be created both ways, is that for the parents and the students who need the choice of distance learning, there will be educators who need the opportunity for distance learning for themselves. So pairing those opportunities up is exactly the what this time frame should uh, should be accommodating. We should be looking at saying, okay, um, are there are there teachers by age or by condition that need to have you know a distance learning environment and, and is there a way that even if they're not directly participating in distance learning can they be participating and supporting that can they be doing lesson plans can they be doing individual coaching of students afterwards there's a role for everybody here without saying we're forcing everybody into you know a, a singular option to say you must you know, the only option we're creating for you is to stay at home. And that's, that's the concern that I think many parents have is, is that they are being forced into a singular option that um, is not what's best for them or for their child. And Elizabeth, I love what you just said about giving teachers the choice and, and having roles for everybody. Cause we, we have a teacher on from Virginia, uh, Ann Salas, who says teach, at least some of her single teacher, single mom teacher friends are writing wills and orders in case something happens to them. And she says teachers are afraid they could catch COVID and possibly die. And I think, um, you know, it is a concern with some of the teachers. Um, and that was a good uh, answer that you had. Um, and then Beverly Roberts uh, writes, given that COVID is less of a problem than the annual flu epidemics, why are we in a panic about opening the country, especially schools? The fallout from the devastation to the economy is more dangerous than the disease. Um, well, just, just briefly, so, um, so that single teacher is, you know, I, I completely understand, but I also have single teachers who say, I have school-aged children and you're expecting me to distance teach all day. Well, I have school aged children at home. I, I can't possibly functionally teach um, with my own school aged children at home needing attention and they themselves needing um, access uh, and to learn online and me supporting them. So this becomes a vicious circle. Um, and then I certainly uh, definitely understand the, the latter point, which is, you know, we, we face, now this is, you know, this is a national and a global pandemic. This is truly, you know, a once in a hundred years um, event, but the science still has led us to the point that you know, we, we have flu years that are devastating in terms of um, uh, the impact on children and families as well. And we haven't had the same level of response. And so having a, you know, culturing a solution for the problem that meets the, the problem where it is, instead of having this one size fits all um, approach, you know, like the issues that um, Dakari and Toga brought up for their individual peers. You know, they've got peer friends who are going to be forced into different schooling systems and that's gonna widen the gap. And then you have uh, uh, professors who are gonna be in a situation where they can't teach if they, you know, if they're gonna wind up exposing themselves um, to, to COVID. So creating those platforms for all the students um, and all the teachers from their own individual needs to have the choice to distance learn, to learn in person, and to fulfill the majority of students' needs, which we know is in-person schooling um, for, for many reasons, is really the path 
forward. We just need to have school boards that are brave enough to make those decisions and okay. have the and have and to have the plans uh, ready to go for uh, you know various circumstances. And Elizabeth, you may have just done it, so because that was a very good summary. But I wanted to give you an opportunity since we just have a few minutes left. If you just want to summarize uh, your thoughts on the subject, just what we're seeing happen in our country right now. Uh, you know, pick a city. You know, from Portland and Seattle to New York to Houston, uh, Washington D.C. All of what we're seeing is the reason your organization is so important. We need to have students of all ages come to know and understand our founding documents, um, why our nation was founded, what those principles, what those um, originating principles were, why our ancestors, you know, some of our ancestors fled Europe in the first place. Uh, these documents, the Constitution, knowing it, understanding it, um, learning your history are crucial for this next generation of students because we've missed at least an entire generation of students knowing and learning it and appreciating um, the, our, the founding of our nation. And um, I'm very grateful to your organization for trying to spread the word on, on that importance. Well, thank you. And thank you for everything that you do, because I know that we, we share a mission and, and we really appreciate your service. And this has been wonderful. We've, I've learned so much. I also want to thank our anonymous sponsor one more time. Uh, we are very, very appreciative for him making this program possible. And another big thanks to Jay McConville on our board for your service and for, for filling in tonight.